At the edge of West El Paso, where Executive Center Boulevard dead ends into Paisano Drive, under the shadow of railroad trestles and behind the remnants of a smelter, you cross over the muddy waters of the Rio Grande, and that's where three states and two nations meet. Texas, New Mexico, and Chihuahua. The United States and Mexico. That's also where you'll find a half-mile stretch of steel and concrete, a line in the sand, and what's been described as the nation's first section of privately built border wall. The confetti and celebratory speeches marking the project's completion came on May 30th. It shows how quickly a private organization can identify the problem, take the steps necessary to mobilize resources and get to the site, and then complete the project. Chris Kobach is the general counsel for We Build the Wall, a Florida-based organization responsible for this privately built barrier. The federal government can do impressive things with its huge resources. We don't have the resources they do, but we do have agility and speed and determination. And that's what I hope you see on display when you look at this wall. The group says it spent more than $7 million to build this half-mile stretch of bollard fencing on a piece of private land in Sunland Park, New Mexico. The money came from people who donated to the group's online campaign. It's not just a fence. It's a road, it's lighting, it's technology. But this moment didn't come without controversy. The, the construction on the wall at this point is, is out of, in violation of city ordinance. Work on the wall came to a stop after the city of Sunland Park accused the landowner of failing to file the right paperwork. So the middle of the rocks is our boundary. And then there's the matter of this gate, a section of the private wall that encroaches onto federal land. That's, that's quite a bit of, of construction on what is federal land. Yes. And critics say the private wall is little more than political theater. That that thing over there is, is, is nothing to do with life here. Um, it was built by out-of-towners who have no respect for our culture, have no respect for our home. But the group behind the barrier prevailed. After a brief delay, work on the wall resumed. And in less than two weeks, the wall was finished. In the foreground, we build the wall's first half mile, completed. And in the same month that workers broke ground on the private wall, a record number of migrant families crossed into El Paso to claim asylum, even in areas where officially sanctioned border barriers already exist. That daily report gets updated where their 30-day average and every day it kept going up. And we would say, hey, it's 500. Oh man, it's at 500. We reached 800. Oh wow, uh, now we're at 1,200. I used to have a pickup truck. I ended up replacing a battery three times because they come and steal it. I bought a brand new gas grill last summer. It lasted me three weeks before they came and stole that. I'm tired of it. We need a wall. We need a wall. I met Jeff Allen earlier this year. He's the foreman here at American Eagle Brick Company in Sunland Park. He lived on site, and back in February, he told me how he would welcome a wall to help with the crime and human smuggling that he said he would witness on a daily basis. If the federal government would come and build a wall down here, I'd let them do it for free. I don't need to profit from it, I need the safety from it. America needs the safety from it. Jeff's offer didn't go unanswered, only it wasn't the federal government that responded. This was the scene at American Eagle Brick Company in the final days of May. Dozens of construction workers, dozens of excavators and bulldozers working nonstop to build a barrier that would stand 18 feet high in an area that had previously been an open stretch of border. By allowing an open border, uh, we empower the cartels. Dustin Stockton is giving me a tour of the privately built wall. 
He's a former Tea Party organizer who now serves on the board of We Build the Wall. We understand why people were skeptical on, on how you could do something like this so fast. When I look at it, 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 it it's hard to believe that, that we could put this together without some kind of divine guidance. Dustin points to the breakneck speed of the construction, and he insists that this steel structure is more than just symbolic. We didn't want to just build a, a wall in the middle of nowhere. We could have. It would have been a lot cheaper than, you know, going up a mountain. Um, but this is the place that we deemed we could have the most impact on with uh, money we're using. But critics of the project say the private wall is merely a tool to stoke a division and raise money. That right there is about fueling some really sad fantasies of, of fear and xenophobia in, in our country, and it's, it's sad, is what it is. Peter Swarzbein is a member of El Paso City Council. Born and raised in El Paso, Swarzbein says the barrier does not represent the values of his community. It has nothing to do with any sort of reality, but for people that are obsessed with, you know, wanting to build the wall, you know, to wall themselves off from the rest of the world, to wall themselves off from their own failures, whatever it is that they're running away from, it works for them because what that is, is a prop. The foundation of this private barrier got its start in December of last year. That's when Brian Colfage, a decorated Iraq war veteran, started a GoFundMe page to build a border wall. So I just said, well, why not me? I rolled it out, I rolled the GoFundMe out, and I told everyone what I did. I was like, hey, I did this GoFundMe, here it is. We Build the Wall quickly raised $20 million, an amount that took organizers by surprise. And we all came to the conclusion that with this money, we were better equipped to build the wall ourselves. So the group decided to pivot. Rather than try and hit the staggering billion dollar goal, an amount that would then be gifted to the federal government, Colfage decided to tap into the existing donations and build small sections of wall on private land. Uh, you know, I never imagined, until Brian uh, Colfage came up with the idea of, you know, raising money from ordinary citizens to build a wall, uh, you know, it hadn't even occurred to me that, that this was possible. And what the American people did was stand up and show them that we can do it ourselves, we the people can come together and secure our borders when our politicians fail us. A week after this event, the state of Florida said it was investigating the We Build the Wall organization, following a handful of complaints from donors. But preemptively, Colfage said concerns over malfeasance were unfounded. Even with all the fake news that says that uh, I'm, I'm buying yachts and jets and flying all over the damn place, uh, it's completely untrue. And as you can see here, we're putting this money to good use. Work on the Sunland Park barrier started over the Memorial Day holiday. Few were aware of what was happening here, and that included officials with the city of Sunland Park. It was out of compliance uh, with city ordinance. They did not get permits ahead of time. Javier Perea is the mayor of Sunland Park, New Mexico. The city ordered a work stoppage after claiming that We Build the Wall was violating city code. And the project came to a standstill. On Wednesday, May 29th, the work site was eerily silent. The wall was already largely complete, and We Build the Wall insisted that the project was in compliance, yet the machinery was gone and the incomplete wall seemed to melt into the sand and rocks beneath Mount Cristo Rey. Uh, this is monument number one uh, currently. On the Mexican side of the border, I spoke to photographer Dennis Daly. He has spent the past several months documenting the changing landscape of the U.S.-Mexico border, specifically when it comes to these white monuments that delineate the border between the two nations. So this monument uh, went in in the 1850s after the Mexican-American War, which m most people believe was a war of aggression by the United States and uh, where they took uh, more than half of Mexico's land from them. Monument One is the first of 276 obelisks that run from here to California. What I'm more interested in is the landscape itself and to see how the landscape is changing because in 50 years, 100 years, it's probably going to look quite different than it does even, even now. 
As head of the Archives and Special Collections Department at New Mexico State University's library, Daly says his work is apolitical. He's merely trying to record and preserve history. So I'm, I'm trying to inform the photography that I'm doing more by um, uh, the history of the area and uh, by landscape photography, landscape art, more so, I suppose, than the politics. Although you can't keep the politics out of, out of this situation, for sure. The landscape around Monument One has changed dramatically due to the private wall. And Swarzbein says that's unforgivable. When you could stand on two countries with one foot in each country, and it'd be good. Like, that's what it means to be from here. That's what this tri-state area between New Mexico, Chihuahua, and Texas represent. The largest binational community in the Western Hemisphere. A place where we would all prefer to get along. And that's what that monument represents. And this, this corny fake prop of, of, of American strength um, is not that. But supporters of the private wall strongly disagree. It's the countries have to keep their sovereignty, you know? You got a Mexico got to be Mexico and America got to be America. It's private citizens on private land with private dollars building a wall. And they're doing it without it. There's no government involvement in this construction. This is entirely U.S. citizens deciding that it's time to defend the border. Uh, there is no, uh, no, no ordinance that in any way conflicts with this project. 36 hours after the city of Sunland Park issued a cease and desist order, work on the private wall resumed, and we build the wall declared victory. We had done our homework uh, long before we began this project, and our homework was correct. The city of Sunland Park had backed off, even as the mayor insisted that certain parts of the project were at odds with city code. It's, it's a problem that was thrust upon us uh, that moved rather quickly and with a community with limited resources that you cannot move as fast. Um, I'm not sure if that was the intention of the organization uh, to get it done over the weekend without any, without any supervision, um, but you know, it is what it is at this moment. Mayor Javier Perea said the city's switchboard was inundated with calls from the project's supporters. He said he received thousands of emails, and among them, he said he received death threats. I personally have received, my family has received death threats um, over the last couple days. Um, uh, but we have increased uh, uh, law enforcement presence. Uh, on Tuesday, I received, I, I believe, was the first death threat that I was aware of, and we did have police presence uh, um, where we were available or where I was present. During the work stoppage, Brian Colfage, the founder of We Build the Wall, had taken to Twitter to say that the city of Sunland Park was corrupt and operating on behalf of Mexican drug cartels. When I asked him about those unfounded accusations, he said he was merely posing a hypothetical. I, it was a question. It says, are, were, who, it said, who was paid off by cartels? Question mark. Was anyone working with cartels? Because of the history that Sunland Park had with, uh, you know, their corruption. Because recently, as a day ago, there were some tweets from the founders of that group making rather defamatory accusations or implying them about you and the drug cartels running the city of Sunland Park. Just your response to that, I mean. Well, it's, um, I think it's a cheap blow to the city of Sunland Park, not only to me, but everyone else who's here. Uh, um, there have been some issues with the city in the past, but to assume that everyone is that way. I mean, I've been called a spick, I've been called a mother I've been called a lot of the different things. But you know what? I'm not going to stoop to that level. If that's where they want to go, I'm, I feel like I'm a more educated individual and a more classier individual, and I'm not going to go there. Indeed, I would say this is probably the best section of border fence. It's undoubtedly the best section of border fence on the entire U.S.-Mexico border. At the celebratory news conference on May 30th, Chris Kobach talked about how the private wall had cut off several drug smuggling routes and how it would prevent asylum seekers from presenting themselves to border agents. Asylum was meant for people who are being persecuted by their governments because of their membership in a particular social group. And those are the exact words of the international definition of asylum. Now it's being manipulated by the cartels to, they just say anyone who's in a, a neighborhood uh, where you, there's poverty or crime, come on up, we'll see, we'll, you'll get your asylum claim. Chris, so, respect, respectfully, the scenario you just laid out, describing the asylum seekers coming here, they'll still be able to do that. Well, the, uh, but, but if it is closed, if, the, if this border is closed off here, 
then they're not going to be able to come in and, and present themselves it, it, a demand that the Border Patrol take them and, and process their asylum claim. They'll have to go somewhere else. But the dramatic spike in apprehensions in El Paso is happening in parts of the city where border barriers already exist, because the majority of Central Americans arriving by the thousands are surrendering to border agents. In fact, a day before the confetti flew in Sunland Park, history was made a few miles away in South Central El Paso. That's where a group of more than a thousand people crossed into El Paso, in an area where the officially sanctioned border fence already exists. According to the Border Patrol, this is the largest group of migrants ever apprehended at a single time. And two days earlier, on Memorial Day, agents had detained more than 2,200 migrants in the El Paso sector, which includes West Texas and all of New Mexico. To me, the most impressive part of that is not necessarily the 2,200, is that 1,850 of those were here in El Paso, and it was between Executive and Midway, just like we put in the news release. In the city core? Yes, yeah. in the city core. And actually, you can say, I guess, the western part of, of El Paso, that's where 1,850 of those apprehensions occurred. Fidel Baca is a border patrol agent in the El Paso sector. He tells me that stations are overwhelmed with the influx of migrant families as agents encounter more and larger groups. And now if you go to uh, El Paso station, you won't only see border patrol uniforms, you're going to see Coast Guard uniforms, you're going to see uh, HSI, uh, just a lot of components from the Department of Homeland Security that have come in to assist us. We have agents from the northern border here in the El Paso sector helping us out. Uh, we've pretty much, uh, you know, the checkpoints are closed. So even our checkpoint agents are not manning the checkpoints, they're down on the border helping with this influx. In the current fiscal year, which started in October, the number of migrant family apprehensions in the El Paso sector rose to more than 104,000. That compares to a little more than 4,700 family unit apprehensions at the same time last year. That represents an increase of more than 2,000%. Baca says agents spend most of their time feeding and caring for migrant families or processing paperwork, which can take three hours per family. Your job at one point was pursuing people, and then that flips to them coming right at you. You know, I mean, of course, there's still the criminal element, there's still contraband that you guys are dealing with, but these huge groups are coming straight at you saying, take me. Uh, you know what, is, we were actually talking about that earlier today. Uh, we just had our birthday, like I mentioned to yeah. you. So so we talk about the history of the Border Patrol and what the Border Patrol job is. Yeah. Is you're out in the desert, you're tracking people, you're finding people, sometimes you're rescuing people, sometimes you're having to run down people. Uh, so it was a very fun job. And just like I was telling my boss earlier today, that's no longer the Border Patrol we know and love. Uh, sadly, we've moved away from that. Uh, I was just talking about this morning, I mean, chasing drive throughs vehicle incursions, driving in through the desert. I mean, that was adrenaline filled. Sure. Uh, biggest one I got was 14 people, 800 pounds of dope in a 20, Chevy 2500. Um, the job has changed. Uh, okay, now we, we're no longer out there. Now we, uh, I mean, hate to use the term, but uh, we're babysitting. Uh, that is part of our mission. Uh, that is part of what we signed on to do, and we're going to keep doing it. On May 31st, at the end of an eventful week, a Border Patrol Processing Center in El Paso was singled out for holding migrants in what was described as dangerous and overcrowded conditions. A report from the Department of Homeland Security said the Paso del Norte Processing Center is designed to hold 125 detainees, but at one point, more than 900 migrants were detained there. The photos and description of the conditions at the Paso del Norte Processing Center in my district are beyond disturbing. Migrants standing on toilets to make room and gain breathing space. A cell with a maximum capacity of 35 holding 155 migrants. Detainees wearing soiled clothing for days or weeks. The list goes on. Our facilities are not meant to hold families. They're not meant to hold juveniles. Our facilities were built to hold a specific type of person, which is male, uh, between 18 and 40, so an adult, and only be in their custody for a few hours. Yeah. That's what our facilities are meant to hold. That is not what our facilities are currently holding. 
At a shelter in Las Cruces, we caught up to Juana Miguel Andres, a Guatemalan mother seeking asylum. She says that in Guatemala she had nothing, that she lived in the same house with her brothers and parents, and that she's hoping to work in the United States and send money back home. Her chances of prevailing before an immigration judge are slim, but due to the current system and due to the fact that she entered the country with her young child, she'll remain legally in the U.S. until her asylum application is resolved. And that current reality frustrates border agents. I'm here to enforce immigration laws, making sure that nobody enters the country illegally. So these people are coming into our custody because they entered the United States illegally. That's why I'm able to arrest them for illegal entry. However, the moment that they keep going into the country, did I really do anything? I mean, I stopped them, I arrested them, I took them into custody. However, they get to continue their journey. At that point, why am I there? So that's, uh, that's another effect that it has on agents. Critics of the current immigration system have demanded that Congress take action to ensure that the asylum system works for people who legitimately fear persecution in their home country, not for people who are fleeing economic conditions. I want to make clear that this crisis is unlike anything we've ever seen at our border, and it, in large part, is due to the gaps in our immigration laws that are driving it, causing a dramatic demographic shift in the flow of illegal immigration to the United States that is placing children at unique and critical risk. But at that same shelter in Las Cruces, Democratic U.S. Senator Tom Udall said he would resist efforts to overhaul the asylum process and instead urge federal agencies to make improvements. We are talking all the time with the federal officials, telling them where uh, they are falling down, where they're not doing the right thing. If there's a problem in terms of a child being connected, a report we have, we're pushing on them to do the right thing. So there's communication, you bet there's communication, and we're gonna continue to push them to do the right thing when it comes to people seeking asylum. I mean, asylum is a very special right that has been put in place uh, internationally. And, and there are many countries in the world that are more generous than we are in terms of allowing asylum. So thank you all very much. Really wonderful to get a chance to visit with you. As the Border Patrol grapples with the remarkable spike in apprehensions, the nonprofits and religious organizations that provide temporary shelter to the migrants are also feeling the strain. The county of El Paso recently agreed to pay for bus services to get migrants from shelters to the airport or bus terminals. The city of El Paso has been doing the same thing for asylum seekers here at Annunciation House, the city's largest migrant shelter. But the director here, Ruben Garcia, says the city and the county should be doing more. You can't have it both ways. You cannot say we love the fact that we are a border city, but then when problems and challenges that are unique to border cities that we then say, we don't want that responsibility. Garcia says the federal government could also do more to address the humanitarian crisis at the border. But he says Washington lacks the political will to take action. The tragedy is it doesn't get done for political reasons. That's why. It doesn't get done for political reasons. And so you have what you have, not because there is a better, more effective, more efficient way of doing it. It's that there are political motives for keeping things the way that they are. A similar sentiment was expressed by former Colorado Congressman Tom Tancredo, a Republican who served in Congress for 10 years the immigration hardliner is a board member with We Build the Wall, and he spoke in Sunland Park about why Washington won't address immigration reform. To a great extent, it was bipartisan opposition to immigration reform. It wasn't just Democrats, and it certainly was Republicans also. I, I guarantee you I was as surprised as anyone when I first went into Congress in 1998 by the amount of opposition that was in my own party. And, and if you brush away all of the words that were used, uh, to, in, in reality it came down to, hey, we get a lot of money from interests 
that are benefited by illegal immigration. And, and on the other side, of course, they recognized it was political power that came about as a result of illegal immigration. So there was this cabal, in a way. By the second week of June, the national spotlight on Sunland Park and the private wall had faded. The national media was long gone. But that's when the federal agency that's in charge of our international border with Mexico cut the lock on this privately built gate. A part of this encroached onto federal land, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Okay. Lori Kozmanski is a spokeswoman with the International Boundary and Water Commission. She says this gate encroaches 33 feet onto federal property. So this is our property that we need access to, and we just are asking for operational oversight of this. Even before the private wall was constructed, the debate has long been whether or not the public can access Monument One. The International Boundary and Water Commission says that is not a park, but they do say the public has access to the monument. It's not a park, no. This is on federal land. Um, we do allow people to come and see it. We ask that they park over at McNutt and walk in. It is about two, two and a half miles to walk in, but we don't allow vehicular traffic on our levee road. Kozmanski says that we build the wall did not file the proper paperwork with the agency. They did send in a permit. Um, it, was a, it was lacking some documents. We've sent them back what we need and our comments, and so there's been back and forth communication. Brian Colfage initially told his followers that the gate would remain locked, but the gate is left open all day. It's locked by the agency only at night. But the agency is still working to figure out what to do about the encroachment. What if, hypothetically, the plans that are submitted and, and whatever paperwork goes through, someone on your end says, actually, no, the, the runoff there isn't good or doesn't meet the environmental standards? What if that happens? Well, our engineers would have to determine that, but at this point, um, I don't have anything, I don't know about that, so I don't know what could possibly happen. Got it, because it's the concrete It's itself. here, it's here, the gate's in, it's here. Meantime, We Build the Wall says it's preparing to build another border barrier, possibly somewhere in the El Paso area, although they again intend to keep the location secret. And donations to the group's GoFundMe page keep coming in, as do the migrants who arrive at the border every day. Reporting from the U.S.-Mexico border, I'm Robert Olguin.